if you learn to recognize this intonation pattern, you will catch more of the meaning that native speakers are communicating. It's always fun to hear the differences between dialects of English. It can be sometimes confusing, sometimes funny, but always interesting. So the other day I saw a short by Super Holly. I have a little bit of a girl crush, I'll admit. And it was about vocabulary differences between British and American English. So of course I had to check it out. And I'll tell you what I heard as I listened to that video. As Holly and her companion Lauren discussed the differences in their vocabulary, my ear was catching their commonalities, the patterns they have in common. When I say patterns here, I'm talking about patterns of stress and intonation that carry specific meanings in English. And like I've said before, this is like an extra layer of meaning in spoken English that doesn't exist in the written form of the language. And since these meaningful stress and intonation patterns are operating all the time in spoken English, no matter what dialect you choose as your primary model, I wanna let you hear them too, so that you can be aware of them get more of the meaning in the English that's spoken around you and use them yourself to communicate better in English. And by the way, if you want to learn to recognize and use these patterns that are an integral part of the spoken language, I'm here to help you do that. So be sure you are subscribed. My name is Dawn and I'll be sharing more videos to help you get more of the meaning in the English that's spoken around you and communicate more fully in English yourself. Let's go to the first pattern that my ears picked up in this Super Holly short, and I'm going to help your ears pick it up too. If you saw my last video, you'll recognize this pattern, and now is your chance to increase your awareness of it. So Holly's companion for this video is Lauren. And the video, as you already know, is about vocabulary differences between British and American English. So Lauren introduces herself this way, and pay attention to what words she stresses. In other words, what words she emphasizes. Hi, my name's Lauren and I'm from the north of the UK. 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 She emphasizes north, right? And did you see her hand? She even uses her body to emphasize north. I'm from the north of the UK. I'm from the north of the UK. Now, here's what's interesting. Under neutral conditions, north is not the word she would normally emphasize. Normally, she would say, I'm from the north of the UK. So why does she switch from normal intonation to this other intonation? Why does she switch from, I'm from the north of the UK, and instead say, I'm from the north of the UK? Why? Well, if you saw my last video, you may realize that it's because of the context of this conversation. We already know that we're talking about U.S. English versus British English, and she's the British one. She's not going to say, I'm from the north of the UK, because UK is not new information. It's part of the context that's already been established for this conversation. It's what we sometimes call old information. So she strips it of the stress it would normally get, and she gives that stress instead to the new information, to the new information, which is where she wants her listener to focus. I'm from the north of the UK. I'm from the north of the UK. I'm from the north of the UK. This is basically the same as saying, I'm from the north of the place we're already talking about. I'm from the north of the UK. I'm from the north of the place we're already talking about. Now, let me show you the words she's going to say next, and let's see if you can guess which word she'll stress. I can tell you that most of the time we stress the last content word in a phrase, and that would be true here. So under 
normal or neutral conditions, she would say, I have a Northern English accent, stressing accent. But let's see how she says it here. So if you know the difference, I have a Northern English accent. 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 Yes, she stresses not accent, but Northern. Why does she do this? Well, as you may be able to guess, again, it's because of the context. We are already talking about varieties of English. So when she says, I have a Northern English accent, it's sort of like she's saying, I have a Northern version of the thing we're already talking about. I have a Northern English accent. So what I want you to realize here is that Lauren is doing something that all native English speakers do, regardless of dialect, which actually helps our listener know what to focus on in a sentence. English is very helpful this way. It's called de-accenting of old information. And this is a feature of spoken English that allows us to give helpful markers to our listener about what's old information that you don't need to pay a lot of attention to because it's already been established and what's new information that you want to pay more attention to. English is very helpful this way. I actually talked about de-accenting old information in my last video. So if you haven't seen it, but you want to dive a little bit deeper, you can check that out. I'll put a link in the description. And if you learn to recognize this intonation pattern, you will catch more of the meaning that native speakers are communicating. And as you learn to use it yourself, it will help your English sound more natural. Now, for the next several terms that we're going to see, the pattern my ears picked up on was not de-accenting. It was a different intonation pattern. And it's one that's so common and also such a source of mistakes for English learners that it's one of the first things I teach my students. So the pattern I'm talking about is what is normally called a compound noun, which is basically two words that come together to form one term. And English is full of compound nouns. And when I say full, I mean full, 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 full of compound nouns. Did I say full? It's full. And just to show you how common these are, I want you to take a look at this paper. I was helping some friends of mine in Familias Bilingües. Hola, Familias Bilingües. Mwah, les mando saludos. I was helping them recognize this pattern in English. And so I marked this newsletter from my son's school. Now, do you see all of the red that I marked there? Do you see all of that? All of those are compound nouns. So imagine if you had a mistake in every one of those places, how many mistakes that would be. So this is definitely a pattern that you want to be aware of. In Holly's short one minute video, they mention 13 terms. Out of those 13 terms, guess how many are compound nouns? Eight. Eight of 13. That's like 60%. So I hope I have your attention now because I want you to understand how learning one pattern will have a huge effect on your English because it's one pattern that you will see again and again and again and again and again. And if you can improve one thing again and again and again and again and again, that's a huge improvement, right? Okay. So first, I want to train your ear to recognize the way this pattern should sound. So you know that all of these compounds involve two turns coming together. And here's the crucial part. It's where people usually make mistakes. You need to know that of these two terms, you stress the first one. There are some exceptions, but I don't want you to worry about this right now because this is the general rule and it gets you the right answer most of the time. So I want you to listen for that intonation pattern of stressing the first part, which basically sounds like la la. Okay, you ready? Newsletter, reading instruction, solar system, social studies, President's Day, base words, writing process. 
And see, here's one where English learners would tend to make a mistake and they would tend to say writing process, but that's not right. It's not writing process, it's writing process. Valentine's Day, family member, not family member, no. Family member, friendship party, classmates, spelling words, popcorn, sunset, cupcake, bathtub, sandbox, sight words. Yes. So I hope that your ear really picked up that it's the same pattern every time we're stressing the first element. And in order to stress it, our intonation rises. So that intonation pattern that you just heard over and over, I'm going to call that set phrase intonation. We are about to hear more examples of set phrase intonation. And some of them are examples from Holly from the US and others are from Lauren from the UK, because this is a pattern that's fundamental to English and it transcends dialects. Actually, English inherited it from German. And so it's very, very deep in the fabric of English. And now that you've heard several examples of it, I think your ear is ready to recognize more. So for the rest of the video, be alert and catch this pattern when you hear it. And we'll make a list together. I would call this a peg. I would call it a clothespin. Mm -hmm. Did you hear Holly's clear set phrase intonation? Clothespin. Now she was speaking very carefully. She actually pronounced the T-H in clothespin. I don't do that. I like to take a little shortcut. Just skip the T-H. I say clothespin. But Super Holly, if you want to go ahead and pronounce that TH, more power to you. Clothes pin. That's a lot of work though. <laughs> okay. But yes, did you hear that clear la la? I would call it a clothes pin. Let's put it on our list. Clothes pin. And here I also want to point out that this is not just an intonation pattern. It's a kind of mental construction. It's a thought process that happens in English, where actually what we're doing is we're taking what could be a longer phrase, a pin for clothes, and we're taking a shortcut and we're transforming it from pin for clothes to clothes pin. And that transformation is not complete without stress on this first element. Clothes pin. I would call it a clothes pin. Yes. Now here's the next example. The next one I will call candy floss. We call it cotton candy. Ah, I prefer yours. So this time the British version uses the set phrase intonation. Did you hear it? Candy floss. Candy floss. Yay, another one for the list. Now the American version. We call it cotton candy. Cotton candy. If you look at the two words, cotton candy, it looks like it should also fit this pattern. It looks like, well, this is a compound. Cotton is a noun. Candy is a noun. Noun plus noun, it fits this compound pattern. We should stress the first element. But did you hear how Holly said it? We call it cotton candy. Cotton candy. So I hope your ear is ready to pick up this pattern when you hear it and also pick up the occasional exception to this pattern. This would be one of the exceptions. And actually, it's not exactly an exception. It's following a sub rule. It's a subcategory, which says that when that first element is the material that the thing is made of, we don't stress it. So cotton, although it's a noun, it's the material that things are made of. So you say cotton shirt. You don't say cotton shirt. So a shirt that's made of cotton is a cotton shirt. A blanket that's made of cotton is a cotton blanket. Candy that looks like it's made of cotton is cotton candy, cotton shirt, cotton blanket, cotton candy. So this is a subcategory of compounds that does not get la la stress pattern. It doesn't get the set phrase intonation. However, a field where you're growing cotton would be a cotton field or the crop of cotton would be the cotton crop because it's not made of cotton. Do you see the difference? I hope so. Now, what's next? This one's fun. The next one I would call a bum bag. That is my favorite. That is so funny. We call it a fanny pack, <laughs> which is also Oh, I don't like fun. that one. <laughs> <laughs> this one's really fun. I agree with Holly. Both of these use set phrase intonation. Did you hear? 
for Lauren, this, and actually I'm wearing one. I, I, I live in a fanny pack. I only take it off to shower and sleep basically. <laughs> Once you go fanny pack, you don't go back. They're so convenient. So yes, the British and the American version both use set phrase intonation. For Lauren, it's a bum bag. A bum bag. So what does that mean? Bum is basically this part of the body. You're behind. And there are many words for this part of the body. A neutral everyday family word would be you're behind. British people often call this your bum. So then they're basically saying a bum bag because I guess it's close to your bum, right? It's close to your behind. So both dialects use set phrase intonation. Bum bag or fanny pack, right? And both of these actually mean the same thing. So the dialects agree, except for one detail that causes kind of an interesting problem. Bum bag. That is my favorite. That is so funny. We call it a fanny pack, <laughs> which is also Oh, I don't very like funny. that one. <laughs> Americans know that British people call this your bum. And so we understand bum bag, no problem. And we think it's cute. And American English basically does the same thing. Fanny is kind of a cute, informal way of saying you're behind. It's a little old fashioned. To me, it sounds like something that maybe my grandparents would have used. I understand it, but don't use it myself. And then kids today might be less familiar with it. Like they might not even know what it means. So the two dialects are doing the same thing. Bag for your bum, bum bag. Pack for your fanny, fanny pack, right? But the problem is this. In British English, fanny has a different meaning. It's actually a vulgar word for female intimate parts. So that's why Lauren has the reaction she does to the term fanny pack. To her, it sounds... Which is also oh, I don't fun. like that one. <laughs> to her, it sounds offensive. It would be like if she told us, oh yeah, we call that a pussy pack. <laughs> that would sound kind of horrifying to our ears. Okay, let's see what's next. The next one I will call an aubergine. That's so beautiful. Let me see if I can pronounce that, aubergine. Yeah. Oh, we would call it an eggplant. Oh, that's not as nice. Hmm, not as nice. So Brits use the French word aubergine. French often sounds elegant to the American ear, maybe also to the British ear. Let me know if French also sounds sort of elegant to your ear. Elegant, and then occasionally it sounds grotesque, but I love listening to French. So to Holly, aubergine sounds so elegant and lovely. And even Lauren agrees that eggplant doesn't sound as nice. But did you notice that eggplant is using set phrase intonation, not only intonation, but also mental structure. A plant shaped like an egg, an eggplant, yes. Now, I disagree. I love the word eggplant, but maybe that's just me. There's something so mysterious though, isn't there, about this giant glossy fruit that looks like an egg, but it's really a plant. It's like egg plant hybrid and it's alive and growing. And I don't know, I love the word eggplant. Okay, ready for the last one? The next one, I would just call a bin. We would understand bin, but we would call it a garbage can or a trash can. Uh. Yeah, we would never use trash or garbage, I don't think. It doesn't sound very classy, does it? <laughs> <laughs> American English again uses set phrase intonation. A can for your garbage, a garbage can, or a can for your trash, a trash can. Both of these are maybe equally common. So how did you do? Were you able to keep your ear alert and on the lookout for this extremely common pattern in English? How many of these did you identify? And can you keep looking for this pattern in English? It can be like a treasure hunt. And I guarantee you that if you look out for more cases of this set phrase intonation pattern, you are gonna find a lot of treasure. By the way, I want to tell you that there are two set phrases hiding in the next little clip of video. One you'll be able to see and one you'll be able to hear. So see if you can find them. And if you do, 
write them in the comments. So now you've taken a little intonation tour with me of this short by Super Holly. And it's also a little bit of a, a tour into my mind because I'm hearing these patterns all the time. And, uh, <laughs> and I really like sharing them with you so that you can hear them too. And the reason it's important is not just because they're interesting, but also because they're operating all the time in spoken English. And I love helping English learners become aware of them so you can communicate better and better in English. And if that's interesting to you, I invite you to subscribe to this channel where I will help you get more and more of the meaning in the English that's spoken around you. And now I have something to say to Holly. Holly. Te queremos tanto, mis hijos y yo. Mis hijos escuchan tus cuentos antes de dormir. Llevan más de un año, tal vez dos años haciéndolo. Los tienen memorizados. Sobre todo los no seas como Holly. <ríe> Me acuerdo que el primero que escucharon fue el de Jerry Pau. Les hubieras visto la carita de asombro cuando se reveló. <ríe> Espero que no sea un spoiler. Creo que todos ya conocen la historia, ¿no? De vez en cuando actúan tus cuentos. Pepito, ¿cómo la contigo? <risa> Eres tan chistosa. Ay, ay, ay. Oye, eh, me encantan las caras que haces. Es que, es que te enojas por cualquier cosa. Esto no puede seguir así. No, él es así. Es divertidísimo. Eres la mejor <risa> niñera que pudiéramos tener, porque a veces te he considerado como una niñera. Cuando mis hijos están contigo, me siento tranquila, porque eres buena, bondadosa, abierta, cariñosa, inteligente, divertida y muy pura. ¿Pura? Le dije pura a Super Holly. Holly. <ríe> Creo que el término que buscaba era que eres muy buen alma. Mira, ahí te va exactamente lo que yo tenía en mente cuando te dije pura. Quiero decir que tocas temas maduros, pero lo haces de una forma tan wholesome que me siento completamente tranquila sabiendo que mis hijos están escuchando estas cosas de ti. Ahora, wholesome para mí, no sé, lo más cercano sería puro. ¿Hay otra palabra mejor? Oigan, si me tienen alguna sugerencia para una buena palabra para decirle wholesome a Super Holly, pues que me lo digan en los comentarios. Eh, tal vez decirle, Holly, it is muy buen alma. ¿Qué tal? Y ahora regresamos a mis elogios a Holly. Te queremos un montón. Mis hijos te adoran. Y yo también. Y te mando besos. Now, for everyone else, if you want to dive deeper into some of these patterns that we talked about today, I have videos about them. So check the description for a link to that playlist. And for more set phrases, you can grab my PDF with audio to hear more examples and get started making a list of your own. So thanks for hanging out with me. I hope this has been interesting. And I hope that this video has helped you connect with English in a lasting way. And I'll see you soon to continue this conversation. Bye-bye.